Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. Uh, this episode is going to be good for uh, life insurance credits in all jurisdictions. Um, no ANS credits in Alberta, only life credits in Alberta. It's mostly a financial planning episode. And the Alberta Accreditation Committee is not generally a fan of those financial planning uh, concepts. Um, we've got also a financial planning credit from FP Canada, a professional development credit from IROC, an IAS credit from Advocus or the Institute, and MFDA. So uh, here on out, we're going to be submitting episodes for MFDA approval as well. Okay. Um, so this episode I have, I'm actually back to, and this is what I, I look for, of course, a financial advisor with an interesting uh, take, and it's uh, Christian Battistelli. Christian, uh, and you'll hear why here. He's very technically proficient, uh, just completed uh, CFP certification, so passed the exam a couple months ago here, and uh, now a newly minted uh, CFP professional. So congratulations to Christian. And um, I think it'd be worth reaching out to somebody like this, somebody who's gone through the program recently, if you're thinking about doing uh, the program yourself. So um, just really good resource and Christian is accessible um, and an active participant in the Financial Planning Association of Canada community. I'll put his uh, LinkedIn connection up in the uh, show notes as well. Okay, because we're going to be talking about joint ownership here, I thought it would be useful to have a little preamble where we talk about joint ownership. Now, before we do, uh, the object for today is, and I don't know, whatever this is, something that sits on the shelf behind me, something I'm, I'm, I don't know, proud is the right word. It's one of those things where you just kind of show up or don't show up to the right meetings and you end up with this kind of thing. But it's my uh, McLeod Angel Award, little nice piece of cut glass here. Um, and it's for volunteer efforts. I do a fair bit of work in my community organization. We call them community leagues here at Edmonton. Um, where make sure that programs like, in fact, I've done a lot of work this winter and last in the midst of COVID, which has been a challenge, but making sure that we could operate an outdoor skating program, There's a couple of rinks that are just across the street from my house, and I have involvement there in everything from hiring the person that takes care of them full time to um, flooding to making sure that we have uh, safe practices and so forth around how we operate those rinks. So been a big part of my volunteer life and I imagine it will um, at least for as long as I live where I live. Um, Edmonton has a good community league presence and um, helps to create a lot of um, let's say grassroots level recreation opportunities. Okay so joint ownership. Um, this is a really difficult concept. There's nothing easy about joint ownership. So when we think about owning property okay the, the basic concept here, if I go and buy something, I go and buy, we'll use a house here because it's the easiest thing to see. So I go buy a house. Well, if I buy it by myself, I'm the sole owner of that house. I have beneficial ownership. I have legal ownership. I have control. When I die, that house would pass through my estate and we would look at my will to determine who is going to own that house at some point later date. Okay, great. That's easy. Joint ownership takes that house and says, okay, now we have two or more people who own that house together. So now you have two or more people who own that house. Now there's kind of two versions of joint ownership, and it's not even really clear that they should both be referred to as joint ownership. The language here varies a little bit depending what province you're in, depending what resource you're using. Um, I'm going to use joint tenancy, joint ownership, or joint with the right of survivorship all sort of interchangeably. It is worth it though, if you're ever dealing with one of these scenarios, uh, you wanna ask the lawyer that you're working with, it shouldn't be, and you'll hear this in the episode, it shouldn't be sort of me, defining joint ownership. These are quite complicated arrangements. And in my opinion, there should always be a lawyer involved with any sort of setup of a joint asset with the possible exception of ownership between couples. I think there are some bypasses here when it's just a couple, 
owning property jointly, there can be valid reasons for this. Now, I'm in Alberta, which is not a probate province, but in the provinces where probate is a big deal, then this would be a bigger concern. Okay, so a joint tenancy or joint ownership or joint right of survivorship, this means that we have two or more people who own property together. And really, each of those people is deemed to have an undivided ownership right with that property. Okay? That means if it's, let's say, a $500,000 house, at least from some perspective, if you have two owners, each of them owns a $500,000 asset. It's not that each of them owns $250,000 of a $500,000 asset. They don't sort of take the property and cut it in half down the middle or take each brick in the house and cut it in half down the middle. They each own that right, that undivided right to that property. Now, what that means in theory anyways, is that each of them could dispose of their interest in that property without any sort of uh, prevention from the other. There would be nothing the other could do to block that. That really is a requirement for an ownership to be joint owner, that each person has that undivided interest. And that means that they control the property as they see fit. Now, there's a question here as to whether another person would buy that ownership. Do I want to buy a property where I'm a stranger to the existing joint owner? So you might have undivided interest in theory, but in practice, it's much more difficult than that. Okay, so in order for joint ownership to be valid, there are what we call the four unities. And I'll include a link here from Step Canada that has a nice breakdown of the four unities. Um, the first one is pretty straightforward that all tenants acquire the property at the same time. All the joint owners have to acquire the property at the same time. Uh, this is something that's rarely disputed. The only cases where you'll see a question around whether or not the two um, owners acquired the property at the same time typically is in uh, matrimonial breakdown cases. There's sometimes a question there as to whether or not the end of a relationship also severed joint ownership of an asset. That's quite a complicated one. That's really best left to the estate lawyers, as is most of this stuff. Uh, we then have the question about an interest in the property. So, and you'll hear Christian talk about this, and I'm gonna just clarify this in a moment. You'll hear Christian talk about this in the interview, this idea of having a non-equal ownership. We can do it. For a joint tenancy, though, a true joint with right of survivorship, we have to have equal interest in the property. Um, title has to come from the same place. That's our third unity. And our fourth unity, so we have the four unities here, is that all tenants have an equal right to possession. Okay, so we have unity of time, unity of interest, unity of title, unity of possession. Unity of possession is a big one. That means that everybody has equal rights to use that property. So I can't, if I'm a joint owner with somebody else, I can't prevent that person from using that property as they see fit. There's no uh, sort of, I was here first, or you know, I'm the one who initiated this whole deal. If you really have unity of possession, that means everybody gets to access it as they see fit. So without the four unities being met, then we don't have a joint ownership. Now, I use the house example, and with a couple owning a house in a joint tenancy, that's pretty straightforward. You wouldn't expect one to sell their interest without consulting the other, um, so that equal interest thing shows up there. Um, and then we have a further complication there that most provinces, although not all, most provinces, there would be a dower right or a homestead right that would prevent one person from selling their interest in the property, even if there's a joint tenancy in place. Unity of possession, again, you wouldn't see in a couple where one person blocks the other from some use of the house. Where this gets more difficult though, is where you have, let's say siblings or a parent and a child owning property together. That's where these joint ownership questions get a little murkier. So let's think about an investment account or a bank account now. Now, you hear Christian in the interview talk about a good use of a bank account, and I agree with what he posits here. I think it's a good suggestion. So 
the joint in some scenarios. I wouldn't always use it to be perfectly clear. And you'll hear that. I think Christian is pretty careful from his uh, conversation here about uh, it depends being the answer to most financial planning problems. Okay, so if I have an investment account or a bank account, this is much more challenging than a house owned by a couple. And it's challenging for a whole bunch of reasons. So first off, we have, let's say a $2 million bank account. And this is actually what happened. There's a true example of this that went to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Pecor estate. And in the Pecor estate, we had a dad who had a big bank account like this, and he named his daughter as the joint holder at the advice of the banker, named his daughter as the joint account owner. And then he subsequently dies. And now there's this question of whether or not that property really should flow to the daughter. Was there truly a joint ownership there? And the courts ultimately said, no, there was not. There was no joint ownership there because, that is, they rebutted the presumption of advancement. They said, no, it doesn't flow to the daughter. Uh, and the reason was because she really couldn't access the bank account, at least in theory. She never behaved this way. She couldn't access the bank account without the father's say so. So the court said, no, and in terms of possession, she does not have an equal right to possession. They never behaved as if she did. There's no evidence that she did. And on that basis, the court said, no, that's out. That's not a joint ownership. And instead, the, the courts really said what we had there was a trust what's often called a constructive trust or resulting trust, where there was no actual trust title or trust deed, but what was happening was in fact a trust more so than it was a joint ownership. And so then really that joint ownership was deemed to end with dad's death and the daughter just ended up sharing in the proceeds via the estate, which meant it was shared with siblings and ultimately ended up shared in a matrimonial property dispute, at least likely it's not so clear that that's really what happened, but that was the sort of core of the case here. And it's that kind of thing, what we see in the Pecora State case, that leads to at least my dislike of joint ownership. As I mentioned, that was something that the financial advisor had suggested was an appropriate way to sort of circumvent um, any other arrangement. It didn't end up working. It ended up in court here. What should have happened there was either the use of a power of attorney or the use of a trust to allow the daughter to control that account for her father. And in both of those cases, there likely would have been no question when dad died as to the distribution of that asset. It would have just been handled in the will. It would have been obvious that we would have had to do that. Okay. Now, the alternative to joint right of survivorship or joint tenancy or joint ownership is a tenancy in common. So tenancy in common is still a form of joint ownership. You have both parties who have rights to that property, but here the ownership transfer does not happen at death. Instead, the asset would have to pass through the estate of the first to die, and then you could have other people who become an owner of that. This is what happens sometimes to create an unequal interest. So you could have a one person at 50% and two people at 25%, for example, that can happen in a tenancy in common situation. So tenancy in common um, is more appropriate typically in non-married type relationships. Maybe you do have kids buying a house with their parents or something like that, where we don't necessarily want that asset to sort of bypass the estate at death. Instead, we want it dealt with in the will and tenancy in common uh, doesn't necessarily have to rely on the four unities. We can set that up without the, all the sort of tests we see for joint ownership. Okay, I hope that that's helpful uh, for a look at joint ownership. Um, following the discussion, we're gonna talk about taxes and joint ownership a little bit. There's some stuff there that we need to be aware of as well. So let's hear what uh, Christian has to say here. Thanks so much, enjoy the interview. Hi, I'm here today with Christian Battistelli. Christian is a financial planner based out of uh, Oakville. Christian, I have that right? Oshawa, actually. Oh, Oshawa, close. sorry. You know what? I, I Well, they're kind of close. They're on opposite sides of the GTA, right? I always mm -hmm. do that with Oakville and Oshawa, and you literally just told me. But uh, And you I know, know they're I, not the same city. Like, I know that 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I grew up in Northern Ontario. So anything South of Barrie is Toronto. Oh, I got it. So okay. Yeah. Only for the last couple of years that I realized there's a difference between Durham and York and Markham <laughs> and North York and all of that. Right. Right. Um, and your firm, so you operate, I know you just passed the CFP exam just like a couple of yep. months ago. And uh, you said today you got word from FP Canada that you can now hold out as a financial planner. Yep. Got the, exciting. got the yeah. email today, which was exciting. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, good Christmas. We're just recording this a few days after Christmas. So it's a good uh, Christmas present that way. Uh, mm-hmm. And you're, uh, you're actually talking to us, speaking of Christmas, you're talking to us from a semi-quarantine state today too, aren't you? Yeah, so I unfortunately on my very last day in the office before Christmas, uh, found out that two of my coworkers had tested positive. Um, so unfortunately, because one of them had had symptoms the day before, they're a couple. So the, the one had symptoms the day before, and then the, the husband had came into the office and I had just quickly, briefly shook hands with him as I was walking out the door for the last time. And unfortunately, not, not wearing my mask at that time with And so that exposure has put me on quarantine for the holidays. Yeah, it is what it is. That's a bit better safe than sorry with that. You got a little one around, right? So yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, And your firm, if I'm not mistaken, so you're insurance licensed and um, also investment licensed? Yes. So mutual funds, I'm an MFDA insurance licensed through uh, the FSRA. Okay. For life and disability. Yeah. Got it. Makes sense. Um, so I know that uh, your practice, I know there's some change happened here recently, but can you just talk us through your practice a little bit and maybe give mm-hmm. us uh, what your ideal client looks like? Yeah, so the practice joining now is based out of Markham, and there's currently three advisors um, working in the practice, one transitioning out, and myself and uh, another partner uh, taking over the practice. And we focus mainly, most of our clients are either retired or retiring. So uh, it, while it's not an explicit niche, I would say retirees would be our the main focus in our practice. And we're a full service financial planning firm. So we do, we charge upfront planning fees and operate on, on I would say a fee, mainly fee-based purpose with you know insurance and, and those products where there's no other option. We still operate on a commission basis for those kind of products. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, twist with the insurance side and the, the fee-based mm-hmm. model, right? Because there's just not, like, the insurance legislation is the insurance legislation, right? You're dealing with a yeah. real problem. So uh, that was one, a few things that I've learned since coming in the industry this, that just never really made sense for me is uh, on some things, but it's just the way it is. And hopefully things will change in the future, but for now. It's an important part of the planning process. So it's certainly not something we can ignore. Yeah. I think to get to the answer to that problem, you have to jump to Queens Park in about 1919. So yeah, that's, yeah, probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so uh, you and I, of course, are both like a lot of uh, guests on the podcast are both uh, Financial Planning Association of Canada um, members. And I find, I, I think you find the same. Like you and I are both pretty active on the forums there both with questions and answers. Um, what jumps out at you as sort of interesting topics you've seen come up on those forums? I found there's a lot of great topics that come up and some of them I find go beyond, I would say you'll go beyond the textbook, which I've always found really interesting. A great example of that is a discussion you and I had recently about directors in your corporation. And kind of what are the, what tax benefits do you get when you name family members as directors in a corporation? And kind of what's allowed and what's pushing the envelope a little bit and those questions they go much a little bit beyond you know what the benefits of corp- incorporating are um, and get into a bit more of the nitty-gritty and I've always found that really interesting because you just you can't really learn that anywhere else yeah there's no textbook chapter on uh, how far you can travel for board meetings with family members as directors right which yeah no there's there's no textbook and it's always good to have um, some or technically versed planners such as yourself weigh in and, and be able to provide their experience and expertise on those subjects, which is great. Yeah, and of course, the only reason I had an answer to that question was because you know somebody asked me, like in my yeah. own corporation, and take it to the accountant, and the accountant says, uh, you know, maybe maybe to Banff, like I'm in Edmonton, so maybe mm-hmm. to Banff, but sure not to St. Martin or something like that. So yeah, no. So yeah, um, anything else that you've seen on there that uh, jumps out at you? <laughs> 
those are the big, that was the big thing I can think of at the top of my head. There's just so many cases that you see and questions that come up in that form that it's, you, you don't really come across every day in your practice. And it's really interesting to see you know, the different planners and their different expertise weighing in on international issues. You know, there's a lot of cross-border U.S., Canada specifically um, in the form that I've always found very interesting to follow because I'm not having a lot of exposure to U.S. clients in, in my practice. It's uh, certainly interesting to see all of those implications and how something that seems very simple, um, if it was done in Canada, the second we cross the border, there's a lot more complexity added. So it's always great yeah, to experience that. That's the one I always learn the most from. I, I don't have a lot of that sort of cross-border experience myself. And I think there's a half dozen or so sort of U.S. CFPs or folks who are somehow licensed in the U.S. who participate there. And just the the complexity, like I just... I don't think anybody realizes how complicated that is until you have a, you know, a specific scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we mm -hmm. had, uh, yeah. yeah, back in season one, uh, Christoph was on this podcast and he talked about a specific case that was just, it was only moving a, and if I remember right now, an IRA across and uh, yeah. it was is brutal. Like there was yeah. nothing simple about it. So yeah, well, yeah. I remember I brought up in the forum the other, not too long ago, I was dealing with a client who would, uh, I, from what I hear, this was a pretty popular strategy to buy us real estate in a corporation to avoid estate taxes. Um, and just the implications of that and how to wind that down and looking at, well, there was no shareholders benefit being reported, but it was the property was purchased with personal dollars put into a corporation and trying to figure out, you know, what are all the details there? kind of how does this change now that this is a U.S. property? And so it's certainly an interesting, interesting subject. Yeah, that is a tough one that uh, U.S. property or U.S. corporation holding or any corporation holding U.S. property or whatever to ostensibly avoid a state tax, right? But mm -hmm. then you run into all kinds of secondary ill effects, which is kind of where we're going to go here today, right? These sort of mm -hmm. secondary effects, because specifically what happened, I'll just give a little bit of background here. Um, I've had a few, quite a few questions actually recently roll across my desk about joint ownership, but I reached out to some folks from the FPAC community and you were good enough to say, that's an interesting topic. I'd love to come on and talk about that. So, um, and recognizing that, you know, you're in the business for about five years here, what have your experiences been with joint ownership, um, dealing with your clients or prospects to this point? Mm -hmm. The most common when it comes to questions around joint ownership is mainly estate planning. You see it quite commonly with, you know, there's a married couple, they joint, own a house jointly, and some of those pretty simple situations. But where you see it get a little more complicated when a client comes in, especially and says, well, I want to name my, my son or my daughter, I want to put them on the deed to my house so we can avoid probate or on a bank account or even an investment account, non-registered, taxable, whatever name you want to use for that account and that's where i commonly see it uh, a lot because a lot of clients hear probates and how do we avoid probate well if i name my child as a joint owner then you know this bypasses probate and what oftentimes they don't quite understand the tax implications of doing that as well as the risk involved and what seems simple uh, just a simple couple documents can actually have quite significant implications and and oftentimes i find clients don't really understand or or haven't gone through all of the steps to realize what they're actually doing when they put that child on on the asset yeah the 1.5 percent probate i mean people get mm -hmm. concerned about it whether they should or not i think if you mm -hmm. framed it as you know fifteen thousand dollars and a million dollars of value maybe that yeah. would uh, change it a bit but well, especially I mean, working in the gta the value of real estate here has gone up so the, the one and a half percent as well, it's uh, oftentimes framed more as a nuisance fee more than anything, just seeing the implications and explaining clients the implications and not realizing, well, if you put your son on as joint ownership on that house and your son goes through a divorce, well, that house is now considered part of marital property in this, or if they have any creditors, that house, they can, they look at that asset as part of their assets. It's, it's now a joint ownership. Um, and not to mention the tax implications, especially on a principal residence. And the second you put that into joint ownership, if it's not documented properly, um, you know, I had a client, this is a situation with a potential client, actually, they were a lawyer um, and they, the, they were single. They had an elderly mom who was single as well or widowed. 
who had a who was living in a condo and they put the condos joint ownership to avoid probate not realizing it well when you do that there's a deemed disposition and now in the last couple of years the, the value of the condo has probably gone up significantly and all that half would now essentially be taxable to the daughter all to avoid a one and a half percent probate fee and of course if she hadn't done that she would have the full principal residence exemption on the the full shot mm -hmm. exactly yeah. And there is some question, I would just chime in here. I mean, there's a question about a transfer of beneficial ownership. And mm -hmm. I know this is something that not everybody is in agreement with me on, but uh, you know, our Income Tax Act really does hinge on beneficial ownership. And I have seen, and I could be very cautious here, but I have mm -hmm. seen examples where property is transferred only to avoid probate mm -hmm. uh, and doesn't trigger any tax consequences, but you have to be mm -hmm hyper careful with your uh, documentation on that. And I would suggest that that's also, you know, asking for trouble from CRA. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I referenced when talking about the proper documentation, because like you're saying, there's a difference between legal and beneficial ownership. And, and that's where you have to be careful. And I, I have seen cases actually where the declaration of trust is put in place by the lawyer. Uh, this was mainly for younger clients buying a home where a parent is going on title and basically saying, you know, this house is, the beneficial ownership remains with the two children. The parent is on basically as legal ownership only as part of the uh, going on mortgage to help with financing. And so that's when there's some extra documentation that helps certainly make things easier. Um, but yeah, where, where that's not documented well, you're, you're certainly asking for trouble. So I'm curious, you know, recognizing like your newly minted CFP, I assume QAFP before that, I actually How? no, I skipped past the QFP. Oh, I was the one, the one of the few that was I got into the CFP pipeline right after they converted to the from the level one at full CFP to the QAFP CFP. So I did the direct to CFP nice. certification actually. You'll be one of the first to have done that then. That's interesting. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Um, so the it doesn't change, I guess, the nature of my question here, which is you know, client comes to you like this lawyer client you're talking mm -hmm. about, and is your advice here more like a warning or do you go through specific implications? You know, you've talked already about tax consequences, about mm -hmm. marital breakdown, mm -hmm. or is it mostly like you should talk to your lawyer, talk to your accountant? How, how mm -hmm. far are you willing to go with that conversation with the client? Well, I always start off by saying um, we're not lawyers and we're not accountants, but our understanding, given our, our background, and I've been working with some other plan CFPs as well in the past, so they also had a, a lot of experience with this, is just helping them understand the potential comp, uh, potential issues that come up with this kind of, you know, this kind of decision and looking at, well, what are the costs that we're actually avoiding? What is the, the savings, that one and a half percent? What does that actually look like on paper, the dollars and cents of it? And saying, is that worth exposing yourself to that extra risk? Is that worth the cost of the extra legal documents that involved to make this, make sure this is done properly? And then saying, you know, if this is something you want to pursue further, we should certainly involve either a lawyer or in the cases where it's relevant, an accountant. So when you give that warning, do people actually bring the lawyer and accountant in or is that sort of enough? And people say, well, mm -hmm. Christian says no good, it's no good. I haven't had a, many clients actually bring the lawyer and the accountant in. Um, typically, I've actually had a, a, lot, a lot more trouble than I thought working with clients' accountants as clients <laughs> continually tend to bring up, well, every time we have a discussion with the accountant, that's billable to me. So they, they're a little more hesitant to work with the accountants, but I've generally worked with you know, clients where the complexity is a little lower and doesn't necessarily warrant uh, the full meeting or a, an extensive meeting with the accountant. But most often it's when clients realize the other potential issues or implications that are they're exposing themselves to, that's more than enough for them to make a decision whether or not they want to pursue this further or not. I'm curious about the, you know, setting the accountant and the billable hours thing. Do you think that's true or do you think people have a misperception? I mean, my accountant, although of course he did our corporate returns for years, but my accountant, he'll answer a question like it's mm -hmm. not. Now, if we're going to set up a, an hour long meeting, that's a different story, but I find mm -hmm. I can bounce questions off, off Jonathan freely. So I don't know what mm -hmm. do you figure there. Well, we do have some accountants that uh, we've worked with that we bounce some ideas off here and there. And that's usually more than enough um, if they understand the generalities of the situation to provide some kind of flow through advice, let's call it to, <laughs> to our clients. Um, 
but I think in some cases it's a misperception. I really think it depends on the the accountants. I, I'm sure some are a little more uh, particular with their billable hours and and their use of hours in, in certain firms. Um, but in the few cases I've dealt with uh, where the complexity warranted it, typically the client will just bring it themselves. Um, although I've, I've certainly wanted to be involved in those meetings a little more. Yeah, it's tricky, right? And I know it's a, like we hold this out as the, the way to do it, right? To have the, you know, you and the accountant and the client mm -hmm. all meeting together. But I know that's harder to execute than, uh, than it, it, it should be, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and what about lawyers then? You said you might send, is this family lawyer, or estate lawyer, real estate lawyer? Who are you dealing with here? It, it really depends on the uh, on the issue. So the, if it's a real estate property we're looking at putting in, then we'll go through a joint, uh, sorry, a real estate lawyer. And that's where we'll refer, refer them to one of the lawyers in our network and, and have a discussion there. That's the most common situation I've seen is the you know, putting a, a child on the home. I have seen a few situations uh, where it actually pays off to add a child in, in certain situations. Like uh, one client I had, they added, they set up a separate bank account at a separate bank and put a, a small amount of cash in that bank with jointly with their child to cover final expenses. So that child would have quick access to cash uh, when they passed away, regardless of any of the other assets, what state they were in. They even went to a separate bank just to avoid any confusion and um, mixing the different bank accounts. One's joint, one's not. I don't know if there's a precedent for that saying if one account is joint, they could look at the rest. But it was a very interesting uh, idea that I hadn't seen done before. And it worked out really well for them. Yeah, at least you'd avoid the right of offset that way. If there mm -hmm. happened to be debts with that bank, they wouldn't be able to. Because yeah. normally with right of offset, they would be able to grab those accounts. whether Absolutely. Was joint or not. So that's something. Um, mm. That's interesting. That's sort of like the, the same argument you see, and I'm a fan of this generally for, you know, a small permanent insurance policy. Mm. In that, exactly. In most cases. So yeah, it's sort of a cheaper way to do it, right? Or maybe yeah, that was, way to do it. Yeah. yeah, that was their own version. They put a few, I think it was around 20,000 in a bank account and said, you know, funeral expenses, you've got some quick access to cash and while the estate's being settled and they trusted their executor. Uh, it was just one of the children that was the executor. So only one of them was on it and there was no uh, family issues to be concerned about. And it was a small amount. So if it did get lost, it wasn't a, a huge factor. Yeah, interesting. Um, and was that person terminally ill when that happened? They weren't terminally ill, but they were more advanced in age. They were in their uh, early, mate, early to mid eighties. So yeah. they were at the point where that was something they were seriously thinking about. And they've seen it with friends and family members and they wanted to make sure that their their ducks were in a row and they had this all set up and it was a it was a great option for them and it worked out really well it sounds like the kind of person you know uh you know how i'm a fan of this but that kind of person who was a good communicator anyways like it sounds like they really mm -hmm. hashed that out with family members beforehand which is hard to beat so. mm -hmm. typically i found the Clients, the clients, when they're a little older and they've gone through a few of these situations themselves, that's when they really realize the value of having those discussions beforehand and making sure that everything's been taken care of. Um, uh, after going through a few ugly estate plans, you know, they've they've certainly learned what it's the importance. Yeah, that's interesting. That's uh, you know because it is a a challenge. So, I wonder if you have somebody who hasn't yet had that ugly estate plan experience, how you can. Uh, mm -hmm get them to to realize what kind of complexity they might be creating for their kids without good planning, without good communication. Mm -hmm. um, now, you said there are cases where you've said joint ownership makes sense. Like, this is a good example. I like that. And that makes sense. The, you know, it's a small amount of money. The kid is not going to, you know, pull that and fritter it away sort of, you know, uselessly. That, there, and if they did, I assume there would be consequences elsewhere in the estate for them. Like, mm. you know, mom or dad would see that happen and say, we're going to put a clamp on, yeah. on having that kid with uh, too much access to the estate. Um, have you seen other cases? You talked about the real estate example. Mm. What happens on the real estate side? That was more of just a financing. Like we were talking about those, it was a younger couple. There had been some transitions uh, where one of the children had transitioned industries. So they had been working the whole time, but because they changed industries, the lender was didn't want to count their previous income. So they brought on a parent to uh, on the mortgage just to help with financing. And what they did is they, they went to a real estate lawyer. We 
put in the declaration of trust. So that just essentially laid out the term saying that, you know, the parent isn't obligated to cover any of the expenses, mortgages, things like that. Um, and the illegal, the, it was a small percentage of the legal ownership with the parents just for the purposes of financing beneficial ownership remained with the children. And it was actually a great way to you know, have a cosign on the mortgage, but not expose the parent to any additional risk and make sure that the, if something happened to one of the children, that the estate would flow properly. Because if you put that parent on as a joint ownership without the proper documentation in place, there could be some complexity to say the least, if one of the children were to pass away. It's an interesting concept because I think most people assume that if you have, I assume it's three people, parent and two mm. kids. So yeah. I think most people assume that that means each is a 33% owner, but that's not the case with joint ownership, right? With mm. joint ownership, it's that you can break the percentages down within some reason, but you can break the mm. percentages down as you need. So that's, yeah, that's a good, I, I hardly ever see that done, but uh, yeah, that's curious. Um, mm -hmm. so. And a good lawyer who made sure, it was also an interesting concept because one of the issues they were looking at too is land transfer taxes, because eventually they wanted to take that parent off the mortgage and off title. So what one of the lawyer's concerns was as well is if you don't have the documentation, this declaration of trust, that potentially when you go to take that parent off title, you're triggering land transfer taxes because there's the change in ownership. So that was one of the concerns that they that the lawyer had brought up as well as making sure how do we avoid triggering any of those transfer taxes when that parent does come off title. And of course, it'll be a residential property. It'll be a principal residence. Mm -hmm. So no concern about 21 year rule with that trust. No, no. Yeah, perfect. Any other, what? so then what's gonna happen in the event of, and I hope, um, in the event of marital breakdown, so does the, with the kids, with the ones owning, mm. the, like living in the house, how does that play out then? Well, the, the, the trust document out, essentially outlines that the, the house more or less for legal purposes is treated as a 50-50 asset between the two children. Yeah. And the parent is really only on there for financing purposes only, so they have no right or no claim to the property. Um, so that was kind of one of the main purposes of that document is save on death, separation, any, any item like that, that parent would not have a claim to the asset or would not be responsible for the liability on the other side. They were essentially holding that property in trust for the two kids or their ownership share was held in trust, I should say. <laughs> and of course, being Ontario, I assume these were Ontario mm -hmm. clients. Yeah. This, there's really no getting around like that that house, that matrimonial home is a, mm -hmm. that's straight up a divisible asset. You, you don't yep. get any workarounds. No ifs, ands yep. about that one. Yeah, that's good. Um, now, in that case, do you find, like, did the client care about the complexity or the client just say, like, lawyer, I'll sign whatever, mm -hmm. just as long as it's going to work out? Or did the client actually sort of understand the nuts and bolts of it? The client understood it. Uh, they're, they're one of the clients um, had some pretty strong financial background. They were um, they came from a family who spoke about money quite frequently and were very well versed. Um, so that was because it was the other spouse's parents that was coming on title. So you know, having gone through that experience, the the wife in that case, having that background with her family, they were able to bring up the, some good questions and some good concerns that they had going into the property um, with that, that parent on title. And it was something that said, you know, we, we always like to treat marriage and everything as death to us part, but you do have to put your financial planner hat at some point and say, you know, here's the implications of doing that. So when the lawyer suggested, suggested that document, it was pretty straightforward. It didn't take too long to put together and it didn't add a ton of complexity to the whole situation. So they were happy to have that in place and just know that everything was done properly. I'm curious then when you, I, I don't know if you were in the room when the lawyer brings up that prospect of marital breakdown, but do you have a sense for, does that cause a real pushback from the clients or the clients say, well, whatever, it does happen and we mm -hmm. should at least contemplate it, you know, think about mom and dad or, or how you're mm -hmm. approaching that. I know when I bring it up with clients, I, I tend to, have a little fun with it and I joke and say okay now I've you know I'm taking off my marriage counselor hat I'm putting on my financial planner hat and I try to make it a very light conversation saying you know 
this is the legal implications kind of this is what's happening and you know helping them understand that you know, we we certainly hope that this relationship will last but we've seen situations where it hasn't worked out and you know this has nothing to do with you know our our comments on your relationship it's just a matter of here's the reality of the situation and you can choose to do something about it or you can choose not to as long as you understand what that what both of those choices mean you don't have like a top 10 most likely to get divorced clients list or something like that no i haven't had one of those yet no all right so i'm getting a visitor here sorry there we go. um so then i think in most cases though when you get this brought up you would prefer the clients not proceed with the joint ownership like these are good examples because mm. You know, I, I am generally not a fan of joint ownership, which is what mm -hmm. sort of spurred me to ask the question here. Um, and you've given at least two really good examples now where joint ownership made sense. Mm. Have you had it where you sort of gave clients the caution and they went ahead with it anyways? No, in, in most cases, they typically, when they understand the, the extra complexity that gets added in with the legal ramifications they typically don't proceed with it uh, they were simply trying to avoid that probate fee or the probate tax they always um however they they deem it as that's typically when they understand oh i'm only saving ten thousand dollars which may seem like a lot of money but when you look at the total value of the estate it could be it's it's oftentimes fairly nominal and the potential implications um are quite high so once they understand really what they're choosing to do, um, most clients I've worked with don't don't end up pursuing it any further. Um, the only time I've had a couple situations where clients went through it, but in those situations, it was less adding a child and more you know, having two separate non-registered accounts and and making them joint for estate planning purposes, but claiming the income tax the same way. And in those situations, it's it's much more straightforward. Can you talk through those a little bit more? Yeah, so it was quite simple. Both uh, both clients had received some inheritance money and their RSP, we were past the point of contributing to RSPs, TFSAs were maximized, so they had their uh, non-registered account and they had always heard, well, put it joint for tax purposes, but it was one of those situations where you know, the, the accounts were fairly even, but we wanted to keep that money separate as they were from inheritances and putting, just because you put an account joint ownership doesn't mean you can claim the taxes jointly. So what they ended up doing is we had, we'll call them Bob and Sally. That's not their real names, but we had a Bob and Sally and Sally and Bob. So we knew whose money was whose, even though they were joint for estate planning purposes to avoid that probate fee, the income taxes were still claimed in their respective names. Um, thankfully the counts were fairly even. So there wasn't a huge discrepancy from a tax standpoint. Um, but that way it was nice. Both accounts were joint, would flow to each other with a spousal rollover, no tax implications. Um, and we would avoid probate altogether. So on first passing, it'd be pretty simple estate, which was which was a win for them. That's that makes sense again. Um, so yeah, really two joint accounts kind of flowing in the uh, the proper direction, let's say. And it, mm -hmm. that's with a couple. That that does make sense to me, right? I I find that's the case where I'm generally most comfortable with joint is where you have a like a couple, and especially a mm -hmm. couple where there's you know, they've been together for a while and the prospects of marital breakdown are, are less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, what about cases where you had a client? Have you ever had this where a client brings you a joint ownership scenario that's already in place and you look at it and you say, oh, we're going to have some work to do here? Fortunately, I haven't. Uh, I did have the one lawyer who, who yeah. brought the, the mom's condo situation. Unfortunately, I, uh, we didn't end up seeing that through the end. Um, they decided to go a different direction, uh, but it was an interesting conversation nevertheless. I have had a few clients where just by sheer luck of the draw, they put money in joint ownership and claim the taxes in an appropriate way um, where they, and it, because this is something, and I'm sure you've probably seen this quite a bit in practice where I say, well, we're just going to claim the tax and whoever has less income that year. Um, and that happens quite a bit, but they just so happened it was an inheritance from one of the spouses and they can put it in jointly because it was a second marriage and their, uh, their view was everything is together. We're not keeping anything separate and they continue to claim the income in the original spouse's name because she had a lower income and it worked out really well for them. And we didn't have to, uh, undo anything or, or uncover any landmines. They just so happened to 
continue claiming things properly, which was perfect. That is good. That is lucky, like you say. Um, now, just looking back to our set of questions here. So, um, and we talked about U.S. exposure a little bit already. Um, have you ever had this with U.S. clients, clients with uh, possible U.S. estate tax exposure? No, I haven't had any clients with the U.S. Uh, the estate tax exposure as much. I've dealt with a client who has you know, an IRA and you know an asset here or there or a trailer down south. But typically, often uh, with any of the clients that I've had, where when we're dealing with properties in Florida or or whatnot, they've typically sold them before passing. Um, or transferred them to their children. And that's been dealt with kind of long before we've had to deal with the estate, thankfully. Um, but that was, that was something we were chatting about before that was actually new to me. And I didn't realize the, the double estate tax on, on joint ownership of the U.S. property. Yeah, the full value gets included twice with, mm -hmm. the, yeah, with the calculate. Now, that only matters if you're subject to U.S. estate tax, which mm -hmm. you have to die with a fair bit of stuff, about 15 million Canadian today to be subject yeah. to U.S. estate tax. So yeah. shouldn't generally be an issue, but I have seen this one go um, go wonky and not exactly ideal here. Mm -hmm. um, now, what about on the insurance side? You ever set up insurance policies with joint ownership? Mm -hmm. Typically, those are tax planning uh, strategies, looking at a, a cottage or and putting in a joint last to die policy. Um, looking at funding or covering some sort of estate tax or some income tax liability on death. And that's typically when we'll put together one of those policies and, and use the joint, uh, joint last to die policies. Have you ever done insurance for um, spousal support, child support following marital breakdown? Um, I haven't actually done any of the policies to do that. And I know this was actually a question in your CF and part <laughs> of the CFP prep. I remember there's a few different ways to do it um, depending on ownership, beneficiary, <laughs> And there's a few different options for it. So it's not something I've dealt with personally, but uh, it, it was a, an inter very interesting discussion when we covered that question in the prep course. Yeah, I think this is, uh, it's one where it kind of depends who your client is and who you're representing here. But mm -hmm. I think there is an argument to be made in marital breakdown situations for insurance that's there for spousal and child support to be jointly owned amongst the two, mm -hmm. two folks who've gone through the marital breakdown. Again, mm -hmm. you're right. It's not that simple. It's a, it's a pretty complicated case. Wow. Now, the one that the most complicated one of all, of course, the RESP. So, mm -hmm. do you do you typically set these up with joint subscribers? Do you think do you even think of this as the same sort of problem as joint ownership in other scenarios? I always thought about this as a little different. Um, the few situations I've seen where there has been a joint and, and most, uh, in most of the cases I've dealt with, it's a family RES, a family plan as well, and multiple children, um, where the RESP is always viewed as a, an asset for the children. Um, so on separation, the few examples I've seen, you know, that account stays as is and is used to fund the kids' education. But it, you're right, it is a little bit of a different situation just because and at least in my perspective, that asset is viewed as this is this is for our kids, and that money is not necessarily split on separation. It's dedicated to the kids, and there's still a, a joint obligation to support the children. You know, what I find interesting about this always is if you go into, I don't know if you ever do this kind of thing, but in fact, I did this this morning for an unrelated question. If you go into the Canadian Law Library online, and you look at cases around assets and matrimonial breakdown, like people mm -hmm. arguing about assets afterwards, RESP is a very, very common item for people to argue about after oh, a really? marriage breaks down. Yeah. Hmm. And it's, you know, there's a bunch of questions that show up here, like whose obligation is it to fund it? Who gets mm -hmm. to decide when withdrawals are made? And I don't know if the problem here is around the actual RESP or if it's that the lawyer who drafts the separation agreement kind of just assumes that everybody's going to get along. So why mm -hmm. would you bother to get into too much? Like, I'm not sure where the breakdowns happen here, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a curious one. I find like, and I, I had gone looking for cases on, I don't know, cottage or something like, you know, some asset that would be more expected. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, just start seeing like RESP after RESP after mm -hmm. RESP. So I don't know if that changes anything for me, but I find it's uh, it's an interesting twist that I I just I hadn't expected with that. 
Mm -hmm. The one issue, uh, interesting one I've seen with RESPs is looking at who gets to claim these, the grants, the edu Canon Education Savings Grant in Ontario. We don't have provincial grants. Um, but when it comes to, so there was a, a one example I can think of, they had a joint RESP they had been contributing to, it built up a, a small amount, but not maximize the grants, and then they separated, and they wanted to open, one of the clients wanted to open an individual RESP, and whatever they put in those individual RESPs would count towards their contribution to the post-secondary education expenses as laid out, and I think there's section seven expenses in the separation agreements typically. Yep. Um, so looking at, well, if one parent maxes out the grants for the year before the other one does, they get a, essentially a larger boost from the government to cover their share of the expenses, even though they both have to pay the same amount. So that was a really interesting one where I could see that getting a little tricky because it just takes one client, makes the maximum contribution January 1st, and the child, because it's based on 7200 per child you can't claim any more grant for that child and the other parent would have to would not get the benefit of that extra 20 percent grant i think i mentioned this once before on the podcast i heard this on sandy martin's podcast i think john robertson brought this up but it's this idea that uh, you know you could have and i'm not encouraging this but you could have a parent who following matrimonial breakdown that person's still a custodial parent and they go set up an RESP with themselves, a sole subscriber on the plan. Mm -hmm. They contribute up to the $50,000. Mm -hmm. And then they immediately withdraw all the funds. Oh. And see, so now you can, yeah, <laughs> you can never get a grant again on that plan, right? Because you've yeah. maxed out your contributions. So oh, uh, that's, that's not uh, one I've heard of. That was, an in, that was definitely an interesting <laughs> scenario. Not something you would recommend for a client, I'm sure, right? That's uh, no, you know, no. We're playing, playing with the, uh, ethical boundaries here but you know it is sort of a and i've thought about this with uh our dsp to some extent too because mm -hmm. the rdsp in estate planning scenarios you run into the problem of uh the two hundred thousand dollar limit hope mm -hmm. like not in other scenarios likely now on that note do you have any rdsps I have, i've only ever dealt with one rdsp and i wasn't working on that file directly um, there's certainly one, uh, I know I listened to quite a few of your podcasts on the RDSP is it, because it was something I had not dealt with uh, in depth. And it's, uh, I just remember from in passing working on that file that it was quite a complicated matter and it, there was a lot of hoops to jump through and just learning, you know, learning about those accounts and the amount of planning that has to go into it. And even just proactive planning, when you yeah. mentioned a few scenarios, it wasn't until I listened to you talk about losing access to the disability tax credit and having to unwind an RESP. That was before listening to your, a few of your discussions on that. That was never something I had thought of just not dealing with the situations where I've dealt with disability tax credits, usually pretty cut and dry, um, but having to think about, well, could we potentially lose that credit and lose access to the RESP down the road? That was a, a very interesting thought exercise to go through. Now, the, the upside to that now is that we now have that problem fixed, right? So mm -hmm. the so now if you lose access to disability tax credit, you still can maintain the RDSP just mm -hmm. at the sort of status quo. So just, okay. yeah, which is a good change that that was, a, a, and I can't remember if that measure was finalized in 2021. It was very recent anyways, that we had that measure okay. finalized. So yeah, and that's, that is a big win for using the RDSP. So oh, that's good. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. Because you're right. I know I talked about that back in season one a couple times. Mm -hmm. And, and it, yeah. was, uh, it was, to my mind, it was a pretty big problem. So, Yeah, it never quite made sense to me that you could, but that was certainly a, a very complex issue that you would have to plan for. And unwinding an RDSP sounded like it was quite a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, and just a lot of unintended consequences. And I do yes. agree with you. There was a lot, and there still is some stuff with the RDSP where it was sort of put in place hastily. And I don't want to criticize it. It was overall, it's a good plan, but mm -hmm. it was put in place hastily. And there was some stuff that uh, I think would have been done better had there been involvement by the provinces early or mm -hmm. you know, whatever. The, and the, the ownership issue being the big one still that's uh, that lingers. So now, mm -hmm. any other um, comments, questions, thoughts about joint ownership or any other sort of related topics here? Uh, no, I think we really covered a lot of the, a lot of the issues with joint ownership, and certainly a lot of the situations I've seen, and some of the more complex or 
you know, abnormal situations that you don't come across every day, the good, the good and the bad. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So, well, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today, Christian, really appreciate your time and nice to hear the, the stories from the field. And as I, I think I've mentioned a couple of times previously, I have uh, not had enough sort of stories in the field on the call on the uh, podcast lately. So I, I really do appreciate that. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me, Jason. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, good luck with uh, the remaining days of quarantine here. I'm sure that's particularly awkward, but yeah, I'm yeah. counting down the days. We're almost through it. So yeah, looks like you're getting some good work done in that time. So yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Hi, um, again, lots there in the interview with Christian. And I wanted to just go over taxation of joint ownership a little bit here too. So when we move property into joint ownership, assuming there is a deemed disposition, you heard me in the in the interview sort of speculate that there are cases where we can have a transfer into joint ownership where CRA might not regard it as a transfer of beneficial interest. So there's that uh, first question about whether there was actually a transfer of beneficial interest. But if there is, let's assume it's a normal case where everybody involved is now going to have beneficial ownership. Well, that's a disposition, okay? So we're gonna have a disposition at that point. Now that generally means that only the portion transferred into joint ownership is disposed of. The portion that the transferor retains was not transferred. So there's no disposition there. So you don't necessarily get a full disposition. You would get a partial disposition. So if uh, mom and dad, Let's say mom has a piece of property and she's going to transfer it to one of the kids. She's going to transfer it into joint ownership with one child. She has disposed of half of her portion. That portion would be then subject to normal capital gains tax. The portion she doesn't transfer, there's no disposition there. She would still have it at her original ACB, although now only half that ACB because she only owns half the property. And then the property transferred to the kid that's disposed of. So now the kid would have an ACB based on the fair market value at the time of transfer. Okay. If mom was going to transfer that property to two kids, and so now we're going to have three people as joint owners, we're going to have mom, child A, and child B. Well, mom is retaining a third of the property. That third is not disposed, but the other two thirds is disposed. And that would then trigger that disposition and each kid would inherit their one third with a ACB based on the fair market value at the time of transfer. Mom would have a tax bill based on two thirds of the capital gain as if she had sold the whole thing. Um, then when mom dies, her remaining chunk would be disposed of. That would trigger the rest of your capital gains. There's a whole question here about principal residence exemption so if that property was mom's principal residence, well, at the time she transfers it to the kids, so she transfers, let's say, the two thirds, well, she would use her principal residence exemption against that transfer. There'd be no tax there. The problem is that any growth from that point on would be taxable and it's taxable to the kids. Presumably then mom's principal residence exemption is not available. Although I have seen some manipulation here where potentially there's an argument made that mom was actually using the whole thing the whole time as her principal residence, and therefore there's no um, requirement to have a, any tax paid. This is one where I would get really good, really thorough tax advice with the facts very well known. I would suggest this is a case where tax advice isn't worth anything unless you paid for it. So really make sure that the facts are exactly articulated uh, to your tax advisor and the tax advisor then can uh, help dissect that information. The other thing that came up here, and you heard Christian talk about this in the interview, in his case of people who had say inheritances or winnings, uh, but when we have property in joint ownership, we don't circumvent the normal attribution rules. I see this done quite a bit in um, advised situations where one of, a, of the spouses has a, a fair bit of non-reg assets and we move it into joint ownership and then just split the income 50-50. So each one of them would get a T3 or T5 for the investment income and we do roughly a 50-50 split. That's probably not valid. 
if one person was the source of that invested dollar, then that one person should be paying all the tax on the investment income. So you don't get around normal attribution rules that way. Okay, the number for today's episode is three. The number for today's episode is three. And I just want to mention one last thing. You heard me at the top of the episode say that this episode is approved for MFDA credits. So just about two months prior to you listening to this episode, and really sort of mostly over the fall of 2021, um, MFDA rolled out its continuing education regime. Of course, up until this point, those who are registered only as dealing representatives with the Mutual Fund Dealers Association don't or haven't had any continuing education requirements. As of January 1st of 2022, you now have continuing education requirements. They're very similar to the IROC uh, continuing education requirements. So the rule here is that at some point in the next two years, so it's a two year cycle for everybody, those who are newly registered at some point in the next 22 or so months, will have a pro rata a pro rata ce requirement but everybody else is going to have a full 30 credit requirement so at some point over the next two years you'll be you'll have to get at least eight business conduct credits these would be sort of specific to mfda issues these would have to deal with um, ethical questions mfda rules and policies legislation that's applicable and members policies and procedures so uh, potentially, although we didn't get it approved as such because we didn't know the regime then, uh, potentially an episode where we talk about client-focused reforms a fair bit, that's the kind of thing that might be good in that business conduct category. We're going to have to figure that out. There's going to be a little bit of uh, growing pains here, I anticipate. Um, and yes, conflicts of interest, know your client, complaint handling, that would all fit in that category. And at least one of those credits, but no more than two must be an ethics credit, okay? And then you'll need at least 20 professional development credits. That's a much broader category. Most episodes of this podcast will be professional development credits. And finally, you'll need at least two MFDA compliance credits. These are going to be specifically delivered by MFDA staff. So these ones will only come from MFDA staff may be in concert with your compliance department. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like yet. So you'll need eight business conduct credits, including one or two ethics credits. You'll need 20 professional development credits. And I would suspect that business conduct overflow would count towards those professional development credits. And then your two MFDA compliance credits. And we're gonna work hard here to make sure that we help you to obtain those requirements. That would be true for anybody, any dealing representative registered as a, a mutual fund dealing representative. So I hope that's helpful. I hope you'll join us again in two weeks time. In two weeks, we're gonna have a uh, follow on episode here. Uh, you might remember, I believe it was uh, season four, episode one, I had Trevor Perry on talking about the individual pension plan and the retirement compensation arrangement. I'll have an actuary on to talk about some of the more technical aspects of those two plans for our next episode. Thanks so much and enjoy your continued studies. Thanks very much for joining us. You'll be able to do your quiz by creating an account and subscribing for $15 a month or $150 a year at businesscareercollege.com. Those who subscribe on an annual basis will also have access to three half-day continuing education seminars covering a variety of topics and capturing a range of different continuing education credit requirements. In order to get your credits for this episode, you'll have to do a short five-question quiz. You'll need the number that I went over just after the interview, the object that I displayed at the beginning of the interview, and you'll also have to recall a few details, nothing too challenging from the episode. Once you have completed the quiz, Within the course where you did the quiz, you'll be able to click at the top right corner. And from there, you'll be able to choose the option to view wall certificate. That's how you'll see your CE credits. Hang on to that, although the system will hang on to it as well. 
I would like to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in getting this episode to air. Jocelyn Lord, Rennie Wong, and Sushami Pamalupaket are the amazing marketing team at We Know Training, which is Business Career College's parent company. Sush also does our video content. Joseph Tong composed the theme music and does the sound editing for every episode, as well as uploads the episodes to all audio platforms. Maria Nguyen takes care of all our CE approvals.